Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. This week is packed with news. Intel accidentally leaked basically its entire roadmap for the next four years, including the DG3 GPUs. Additionally, there's an RTX 2050, that's a real thing, it's not a rumor. There's an RTX 3050, that is a rumor, it probably will become a real thing. We'll be talking about both of those. Intel is allegedly readying an Intel i9-12900KS SKU right after the 12900K came out, and we have plenty more to talk about from just the last week in hardware news. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and the Thermaltake Tough Ram XG memory. Thermaltake's Tough Ram XG series is a freshly updated line of RGB memory available in frequencies ranging from 3600 megahertz up to 4600 megahertz. Thermaltake's Tough Ram XG uses 10 layer PCBs and heat spreaders affixed with bright LEDs everywhere, and they market toward overclocking support and capabilities. Learn more at the links in the description below. A couple quick things relating to GN from the last two weeks or so that I wanted to bring up. First of all, I went on Lewis Rossman's channel and we did a really fun board repair. It was extremely educational for me. Talk about that more in a minute. Uh, additionally, we launched the video that shows our fan tester being unboxed. It's on the channel if you missed it. A really fun video and it shows what we're going to be working with. We launched our new red and black mouse mats, which are on store.gamersnexus.net. And these are what's helping us fund our testing equipment purchases and our extremely long training sessions we'll have to go through for using the fan tester competently and correctly. And on that point as well, the large volt mod mats are back in stock. So the mouse mats, the mod mats, everything else on store.gamersaccess.net. As always, the best way to support us and also you get something high quality and useful in return so you can put it to use at your gaming PC for building PCs if it's at the mod mat. And the mod mat also has all kinds of useful diagrams on it. We've got the 24 pin Molex connectors, PWM, CPU and GPU power connectors, connectors, RGB connectors, those are hard to figure out uh, if you haven't worked with them before, and Ethernet wiring diagrams, so if you do any work with any of that stuff, it's easily accessible on an anti-static conductive work service that we go through extensive QC processes to get to the exact spec we want. Now, the mod mats have consistently for about three or four years now sold through almost immediately when we get them in stock. They move really fast. If you want one and you don't want to wait months for a back order, now is the time to order. And for those of you who had a back order, it's shipping in the next few days or so. So store.gamersaccess.net, if you'd like to grab one of those. They are highly rugged, durable work surfaces for building computers or just working on whatever you work on in your garage shop. Protect the table, protect the components, and gives you some useful diagrams and screw sorting trays for your project. As for the new red and black HUD mouse mat, we launched this with the fan tester. These just came in, they're brand new. They're already selling through extremely fast with the fan tester video. There should still be plenty in stock for now at least when this video goes live, but they are moving through pretty quickly. So this was the most requested color combination we had after launching our extremely successful blue and black wireframe mouse mat, which is still on the store. This one is red black with some blue accents on it. It's got a bright red rubber underside that's completely custom tuned with a red stitched border for anti-fray and nice color matching with the extremely vibrant red print on the front. So they're desk sized mouse and keyboard services for you. And as a special bonus for the next couple days only, we are going to be mixing in 50 signed and numbered versions of these HUD mouse mats that will be mixed in randomly with the orders over the next few days. So you have a chance of getting one if you order. So that's the best way to support us. Happy to launch it. And this design actually was a lot of fun to work on with Andrew. Uh, it took us a little while to really tweak it and fine tune the red. Red's an extremely hard color to manufacture for some particular reason, but we are happy with the one that finally came out. Uh, so grab that on the store. So for additional news, visiting Lewis Rossman was a lot of fun. Uh, I was up in New York. It was just me, so I didn't go up there with the team or anything, but we do plan on going back for some, uh, hopefully filming something at Lewis's repair shop in the future. If you don't know, he runs the Lewis Rossman YouTube channel and he has a repair group called Rossman Repair Group, mostly known for working on Apple and spearheading in some ways right to repair efforts in many ways. Uh, so what we did was an impromptu stream. I showed up at his office. Uh, I said to the very nice people at the front of the repair shop, is Lewis around? To which they said, no because I was completely unannounced and, you know, mask and coat and everything else, and it was a different state. But uh, once we discussed why I was there, Lewis showed up. So really fun stream. He set me forth to repairing an Apple board. I think it was a MacBook Air or something, motherboard. Uh, he taught me a lot about basics of soldering, 
uh, basics of working with the iron, working with hot air stations, all this stuff. I asked a lot of questions during the stream that he ended up keeping the questions and the answers in the video. So if you've never done any of this stuff, you have the level of experience I did, which is very close to zero, then you might find it pretty useful and educational. It's also, it was just a lot of fun hanging out with him. So that's on his channel. If you want to check it out, we'll link it below. And a really quick note on a wrap up for the Eden Reforestation Project's charity campaign we were doing, where we were donating based on the store sales and revenue for the past couple weeks or so. We ended up with a total of $7,250 donated to Eden Reforestation Projects. That is from the uh, percent share from the store sales, from some of our distributors' money he kicked in to help out. He's awesome. He handles all of our shipping, packaging, everything. Whenever we do one of these charity drives where we pick a group to donate to based on store sales, he pitches in and drives up the donation as well, which is awesome. So thank you to our distributor for that. And, uh, and then some other funds that I kicked in there too. So $7,250 is what went to Eden Reforestation Projects. Uh, by their counts previously, that should be somewhere in the range of 72,000 trees or so. Their cost is about 10 cents per tree, but it varies by the type of tree in the region they're in. And if you missed the episodes where we announced that, uh, Eden Reforestation Projects basically employs people who are uh, impoverished or in poor working conditions, gives them a good paying job that has long-term survivability as a job because they have to take care of the forest afterwards. It restores the local habitats and ecosystems uh, and it economically supports the areas where it does so. So awesome charity. We are always happy to work with them and thank you all to supporting that effort. Okay, first news item for hardware. Intel is allegedly readying an i9 12900 case. S skew. The S is important on this one. According to a recent rumor that was initially published by video cards and has since grown legs and run everywhere, Intel is working to get a pre binned i9 12900KS CPU into the market. If you remember, the 9900KS was the last one, the most recent one, maybe even the only one that Intel has done with an S after the K, and all that indicates is it's been specially selected and it runs at a higher boost clock than typically. Our assumption would be that this is Intel's attempt to head off the upcoming uh, AMD Zen 3D, we'll call it, launch for AMD's Zen 3 CPUs that are re-releasing with a larger L3 cache from 3D stacking. There's some great graphics out there from AMD showing this, but where they're fusing more uh, cache straight on top of the existing CPU. So that's probably why Intel's launching this gives it something to compete where AMD has been reporting a 15% improvement on average in gaming just from stacking a bunch more cash straight on top of the existing dies uh, without even an architectural shift. The 12900KS is uh, supposedly, if it exists and it probably will, going to have an all-core P-core or performance core boost of 5.2 gigahertz specifically all core, that's the important part here. Whereas the existing 12900K, the normal one, has an all core P core boost somewhere between 4.8, 4.9 gigahertz out of box, depending on the different variables at play for the workload. So this will be the first time Intel has introduced one of these since the 900KS. And uh, if such a part exists, it's a good bet. We'll see it at CES 2022, which is just a couple weeks away at this point, along with Intel's upcoming, hopefully, non-K SKUs for Alder Lake, which would introduce the lower end, cheaper end of the platform along with the 12700 and 12900 non-K uh, for people who don't overclock or don't care to. The next one is another rumor. This one is on the NVIDIA RTX 3050 series, apparently a four gigabyte and eight gigabyte set of cards with some CUDA core changes as well. So it's not just the memory that should be arriving uh, eventually, I don't know, CES 2022 maybe would make sense as an unveil for that one as well. This is according to hardware leaker copite 7 kimi who has a particularly good record with NVIDIA's Ampere-related products. NVIDIA is prepping the long rumored RTX 3050 to ship in the form of two separate SKUs. Additionally, NVIDIA will allegedly further segment the SKUs based on the CUDA cores on the die, as well as possibly the GDDR6 memory speed. Once upon a time, rumors claimed that NVIDIA would be utilizing its GA107 silicon for the RTX 3050, though according to the new leak, that appears to have changed. Instead, NVIDIA is now prepared to use its GA106 silicon, which is already found in NVIDIA's RTX 3060, and you can even see it emblazoned on the die in our 3060 teardown. Using the GA106 GPU as a likely scenario, as NVIDIA would presumably be recycling dies that didn't make the cut for the upper shelf cards. Now, sometimes the silicon companies do this artificially, and sometimes they do it legitimately based on the demand, where if you have, and this has happened with some of AMD's older CPUs, like much older CPUs especially, 
or if you have one product that's outselling the higher tier products and it looks like they're not going to sell through the higher tier products anytime soon in order to keep up with the demand and to capitalize as much as possible on the supply that they have, companies at least used to fuse off parts of the product artificially and effectively bin it down or, or at least shunt it down to a lower tier skew. Uh, these days, don't know how much they do that. Probably not too much because it's going to sell anyway. You might as well sell it at a higher margin if you can. Uh, what else they do though is the dies that fail validation or fail for one reason or another, maybe you have a bad memory controller in there. If it's a GPU, for example, uh, you have a bad SM, something like that, SM block then they can bring it down and sell it as a lower tier card with the same GPU, but with different parts fused off or disabled or non-functional uh, because they failed some form of validation testing. So you might see this where um, one part of the die versus another is, is inactive and unusable. Maybe that's what they're doing with the 3050. That'd probably make more sense than artificially fusing things off because Nvidia doesn't need to do that right now. Uh, certainly they'd sell it anyway if it were working in a higher tier. So then they're rumored to have two GA106 variants carved out for the 3050, the 106-150 and the 106-140. The former would power the 3058 gigabyte, while the latter would go into the RTX 3050 4 gigabyte model. The GA106-150 GPU could offer as many as 2560 CUDA cores, while the GA106-140 could offer 2304 if the rumors are accurate. It's also possible that NVIDIA intends to opt for slightly slower GDDR6 memory and will almost certainly use a smaller memory bus compared to the RTX 3060. So for this one possible late January or early January launch for this, NVIDIA has a, kind of a track record, at least in the last three generations now, it's about the 1060 of launching its uh, cards in this price tier around CES or February, depending on how they line it up. So that's what it looks like for that one. Uh, additionally, in other NVIDIA news, this one is a news item. It's not a rumor. NVIDIA has launched the RTX 2050. This is not something you'll be putting in a desktop computer, uh, and it's not even running the Touring architecture, which is what the 20 series was using. So instead, the 2050 is a laptop GPU. This will be either MXM or the soldered on type for the uh, PGA type for laptops. It uses Ampere, that's 30 series architecture. And although technically announced, NVIDIA won't actually be shipping these products until probably about spring of 2022. So the RTX 2050 will host 2048 CUDA cores. Again, this is news, not a rumor. It's the same as the 3050 Ampere GPU for laptops, the real one, the one that's out, not the rumor one we just talked about. So that's the same, but it drops down in the boost clock to 1477 megahertz from 1740 megahertz. The memory bus also got truncated and width cut down to 64 bits wide instead. It's technically RTX and technically Ampere, but there's not a lot of power in this model. The 20 naming is maybe suitable and is certainly better than calling it a, an RTX 3050 64 like bits or something like that, or some otherwise confusing naming because Nvidia has done that in the past with say like a GT 1030, GT 730, where it can go all the way back to being a GT 430, but it's still called a GT 730 and the driver support stopped because it's a GT 430, even though the name is 730, even though there's another 730, that's not a 430, nor is it a 630, but it could be a 630. So you've got this nice confusing web of maybe 12 different types of GT 730 that could exist. Anyway, what was the point? The point was that if NVIDIA names it RTX 2050, uh, it would at least make more sense than naming it RTX 3050, which already exists for laptops, but making it worse and not making the specificity very clear like Nvidia has done in the past. So it's kind of hard to fault them for at least introducing a new name entirely rather than sticking with the same one and tacking on some subtle distinction at the end that no one will understand unless they follow technology. Up next, Intel published a driver update for its 11th gen NUC kit. But before you skip ahead because you're thinking driver updates are boring, I don't care, nor do I have one of those, the driver update's interesting because Intel accidentally leaked its entire roadmap through 2025, or maybe accidentally. Sometimes you don't really know. It's a great way to draw up news, I guess. While the beta driver was seemingly left on Intel's website for several days, it doesn't appear to be available anymore. The beta or test driver provided new DCH graphics drivers for the 11th gen NUX on Windows 10 and 11. Most notably though, again, was the roadmap. While many of these have been rumored, very few have been made official by Intel. These include Intel's DG3 GPUs, carrying the codename Elasti, 
and are rumored to be on Intel's Battle Mage architecture. Yes, these are real names, and yes, probably the engineers who worked on it play either tabletop RPGs or some kind of MMO. Like, legitimately, they, they're probably actually gamers, so that's probably a good thing in this instance since they're gaming GPUs. Additionally, there's a mention of several unreleased ARC GPUs, such as ARC A380, ARC A350, ARC A370M, ARC A350M, those are probably mobile ones for laptops, and Iris XE A200M. The driver notes also list several unannounced CPU platforms, but ones which have been rumored. That would include Raptor Lake, that's widely believed to be the successor to Alder Lake in 2022, Meteor Lake, which is based on Intel's uh, 4 process, as they call it, which is 7 nanometers, but it's called Intel 4. That's expected in 2023. Arrow Lake and Lunar Lake also announced Lunar Lake roughly 24 after Meteor Lake. Also, it suggests that Intel is planning to double and quadruple the GPU count of its iGPUs, the integrated graphics processors in its CPUs over the next few years compared to with what we've been seeing from Alder Lake thus far. So the driver notes show Meteor Lake calling for a 3x4x16 or 192 EU configuration. That would be Intel's naming for execution units, EUs. And while Arrow Lake will supposedly support 6x4x16 or 384 EUs for the configuration, we don't have any official specs beyond that for the rest of the stack. So. Uh, that's at least what's been excellently announced by Intel thus far. Up next, a year later now, Sony is finally offering what dbrand got almost sued for, which is PS5 faceplates that are actually colored something other than the stock white coloring. So Sony has a kit of black, and it looks like several other kits planned for the faceplates for the PlayStation 5 and new color combinations for the controllers. This comes a few weeks after a patent for Sony's faceplates was spotted, suggesting that the custom faceplates were indeed imminent. The faceplates will include the highly requested black, which they're calling Midnight Black, but will also include Cosmic Red, Nova Pink, Starlight Blue, and Galactic Purple. Or as I initially read it when I was uh, reading through this for editing, Garlic Purple. Not the name, but you know, Sony, that one's for free if you want to take it. It might be better than Galactic Purple. I don't know. The market will decide. The faceplates will also match corresponding PlayStation 5 DualSense controllers uh, of the same color for those, and the Midnight Black and Cosmic Red ones are slated to ship the soonest in January of 2022, while the remaining color options will be seen sometime in the first half of 22. Pricing for these is $55 for the faceplates and the new controllers are 75. All of this, of course, comes after Sony released its legal hounds on a number of third parties selling compatible PS5 faceplates, most notably dbrand and its line of PS5 dark plates. While dbrand did eventually succumb to a cease and desist from Sony, it wasn't without a big Reddit post and, of course, wasting no time in launching its new dark plate 2.0 designs. Up next, Seda Project Red is settling a lawsuit. Uh, the embattled developer is planning to settle a class action lawsuit brought against it by investors for the Cyberpunk 2077 launch last year. The lawsuit in question was filed in U.S. courts last year, and it's being handled by Rosen Law Firm, who deal exclusively in shareholder and investor litigation. Because if you play the market and enough people are mad about being down, then you, you sue the people who you took a gamble on. Anyway, in its press release, CDPR disclosed that a settlement would include a rather paltry $1.85 million payout. We use the term uh, paltry here primarily in relation to other numbers that we have for Cyberpunk. For example, despite 2077's abysmal launch state, the game quickly recovered its estimated $316 million budget and more through pre-orders alone. And the game has still sold at least 13.7 million copies as of just 2020. CDPR even spent $2.2 million on refunds, itself a larger figure than the $1.85 million settlement. The company noted in its press release that there were several factors influencing the settlement negotiation terms. We'll put that block of text on screen. And on that note, actually, we'd be really curious to see your comments on this because it's been a little while since we've sort of engaged with the community about Cyberpunk 2077. A couple questions, though. Uh, are you playing it actively? Have you stopped uh, or did you stop and then start again? Are you satisfied with where it is today? And sort of give us a, a brief picture of the overall game state now because we still use it for benchmarking for CPUs and GPUs. We've talked about potentially cutting it from the test suite, but it'd be great to hear from you all how relevant CDPR uh, Cyberpunk 2077 still is for you. It's at least a good synthetic one, though, even if you don't play it, because 
It's pretty abusive on the components. All right, up next, Dell shows off Concept Luna, which is a modular laptop prototype. That's right, Dell, which is recently best known on this channel for things like strapping several pounds of plastic to an otherwise useless metal box that's decades old in its design or at least appearance, and using a stock Intel cooler on an $1,800 computer, making sure it's as disposable and useless within just one year as possible, is now working on investing in sustainability for a laptop instead of the millions of computers that it already ships. Yes, that Dell, the same one whose motherboard form factor for the G5 5000 is the very standardized and popular fuck you form factor, and whose power supply repairability standard is a dumpster. That's the same Dell that's working on repairable laptops for survivability. Buzzwords. Anyway, what we're saying is Dell's got a lot it could work on, um, but, you know, doing those things on a new product instead of the millions that it already ships and existing products is better marketing. So that's what they're doing now. So now that Framework has an in-market product and is a small company that's sort of threatening the incumbents, Dell is incorporating modular and repairable approaches to laptops on its own. Rather, what Dell is showing off is more of a design philosophy and a set of tenets it wishes to apply in the coming years to hopefully curate a more repairable and sustainable product ecosystem. Uh, of course, Dell's history greatly supports this beyond the examples we just gave. You only need to look at its resultant lawsuit of the Alienware Area 51M RX series of laptops that were allegedly upgradable but weren't to understand how committed it is to this idea. Dell collaborated with Intel for a working prototype that checks a lot of repair boxes. The design eschews any kind of adhesive. It tones down the use of screws, although we'd argue this is something that you want in a repairable laptop, and it tones down the use of solder. It features a design intended to be more granular for control over repairs, like replacing a screen, something that's typically a death knell for a laptop. Dell also mentions the idea of harvesting parts from older systems and recycling them into newer ones and selling them at a lower cost. Wow, amazing. That's so cool. Instead of throwing it out, you could reuse it. Super innovative. Thanks, Dell. Dell goes on to mention laptops sharing a universal chassis and form factor. <laughs> Sorry, that was funny. Making part, making part interchangeability between them easier. But again, these are all just ideas and concepts, and Dell isn't actually shipping any hardware like this anytime soon. The company claims that these types of concepts will inform future design choices and help the company move towards addressing e-waste. <laughs> Dell, Dell, look, look at me. We, we, need, we need to come back to reality a little bit. It will take decades before you can pay off your e-waste debt from the proprietary garbage parts you shit out into the market. Anyway, we have a tiny bit of skepticism for what Dell will or will not achieve with Luna, but time will tell. Uh, genuinely, we are more than happy to give companies uh, a boost and a shout out and support and point people in our audience towards purchasing from them if they actually do something worthy of improvement. Great example, Cooler Master shipped probably the worst case I had ever reviewed at the time we reviewed the H500P. And look at what they came back with. They came back with the H500P mesh, fantastic case, fixed basically everything. The H500M, they shipped the NR200P, really good mini ITX case. They recovered, and we're happy to support that. That's awesome. Just like Montech. Montech shipped the Air 1000 Lite, and it had air in the name, but not in the actual performance. And so what do they do? They immediately start revising the panel. They offer free panel upgrades for existing customers of the case we had reviewed, and they took it seriously. Dell is far larger than at least Montech, although Cooler Master is pretty damn big. Uh, so we don't expect them to just listen to us. But you know, the point is, I'd be happy to give Dell accolades and talk about how great they're doing if I believed them. But right now, what Dell is doing is trying to capitalize on the hot topic that is right to repair. It's trying to capitalize on environmentalism and reducing e-waste, which are noble goals that we very heavily and monetarily support. But unfortunately, because of Dell's actions of shipping the stuff that they do now that we reviewed recently, it's just, it's, I don't know that I can believe it. Uh, but we'll see what they do. Hopefully this is a start of things. But you know, Dell, again, the place to start is in the products you're actually shipping, not a pretend make-believe product that might exist in the future. There's a lot that could be done here. And uh, hey, if you improve one of the existing ones and someone at Dell is watching, ship it to us. 
if it actually improves on all the stuff that everyone's been complaining about, not just us, we'd be happy to review it and say, look at all these great things Dell has done for all the buzzwords you want to use, e-waste, environment, uh, repairability, whatever it is, if it actually improves for those things, I'm all for using it for marketing. That's totally fine. But it does actually have to move the needle on them and not just be a concept. Anyway, let's move on. MSI, limited edition Z690 godlike motherboard will cost $2,100. actually just saw our uh, friend of the channel, Dare Bauer, posted a video of this. I haven't personally checked it out yet, but will be as soon as I'm done filming this. And you should check it out as well. Check out his channel, Dare Bauer, on YouTube to see it. Anyway, MSI is taking the wraps off of its much hyped Z690 godlike motherboard with an equally godlike price of $2,100. MSI has been teasing the new board since at least October, but has finally decided to announce the board properly and hope someone can afford it. To frame the cost a little bit is some bundles with an AIO liquid cooler, that's the MEG core liquid line, and a Kingston Fury kit of DDR5 6000 32 gigabyte memory. The motherboard itself is of the larger than ATX variety, of course dubbed EATX, meaning it won't actually fit in any case that MSI sells at the moment, but that's fine because no one wants this secure 500X. The MEG Z690 Godlike also comes with a detachable IPS display measuring three and a half inches with a resolution of 480 by 800. The display can be used to show component temperature, clock speeds, and can also be used to make CPU adjustments. We suspect you could probably get Doom running on it as well. MSI only plans to sell the new MEG Z690 Godlike board to customers who have previously bought and registered an existing Godlike motherboard or one of MSI's RTX 3080 or 90 graphics cards. Assuming you meet the requirements and your wallet is at least this tall, you will be able to purchase one of these at about the end of January, according to MSI. Up next, Microsoft partnering with iFixit for OEM repair tools in a surprise move and one that's hopefully a boon for repairability. Microsoft is working with iFixit to manufacture and sell repair tools for its Surface devices. According to iFixit CEO Kyle Weens, quote, iFixit Pro independent repairers, Microsoft authorized service providers, Microsoft experience centers, and Microsoft commercial customers can now purchase these service tools for Surface devices directly from iFixit.com. Initially, there will be three tools iFixit will be manufacturing for Microsoft. There's the Surface Display Bonding Frame, the Surface Battery Cover, and the Surface Display Debonding Tool. The tools will all be offered with appropriate weights and accessories, according to iFixit. And for now, these tools will only be available for the above-mentioned parties, though iFixit hopes to offer more tools to the DIY community in the future. And uh, hey, Dell, if you're still watching, this is the type of move to do. Partner with someone like iFixit to show that there's actually some weight behind the statements. NVIDIA GeForce 3080 tiers, now available not as a GPU, but as a GeForce Now option, and it's kind of an expensive one. Back in October, NVIDIA eagerly announced its GeForce RTX 3080 tier for its GeForce Now game streaming service, uh, and at the time it was only available as a pre-order, meaning that you effectively stand in line and wait for the opportunity to basically rent an RTX 3080 in the cloud. Anyway, NVIDIA has now announced the service is available. It's $99 for six months or 200 for a year. As of writing, there's no monthly option. The math works out to about 1667 or so a month. And as a reminder, GeForce Now is a bring your own games affair, allowing users to access an RTX 3080 server, and then you log into your existing digital storefronts, such as Steam, Epic Games, GOG, or whatever. Now, GeForce Now still only supports certain titles from those stores, so you'll want to check their supported games list before you buy into it. We did a benchmark and review of several game streaming services a couple months ago. GeForce Now is in there. We'd encourage you to check it out. GeForce Now is one of the more interesting ones. Uh, genuinely, it had some, some promising aspects to it that were missing elsewhere, although Microsoft Service is probably the closest competitor overall for the feature set of the price. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to grab one of our brand new red and black HUD mouse mats that are desk sized with the custom red rubber underside, red stitching, and the gaming interface layout on it. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thank you for watching, as always. We'll see you all next time.